Okay, good. Uh, good afternoon. Good evening, everyone. It's a, a great pleasure to welcome you to SOAS for this, uh, this evening's uh, talk and discussion. For those of you that don't know me, uh, my name is uh, Graham Ware. I'm the new head of College of Law, Anthropology and Politics, uh, and I've been here for uh, three months. And one of the good things about starting a new job in an institution like SOAS is that you get to meet and to learn about some of the uh, fantastic research that's going on in the university and to meet some of the esteemed guests who come to visit this institution and give its kind of world-class um, profile around the global south and, and particularly in the region of Southeast Asia, of which myself, I'm also um, a, a scholar in that particular field. So I think today's um, talk opens up a whole range of debates around politics and political process. But also I think as well, and I'm hoping very much to hear from our, our guests today, very much thinking about and reading our guest profile, looking at ideas about how a kind of creative process uh, around and reflection on uh, the politics of a particular context and thinking about the cosmological underpinnings of political process and that how that is played out, for example, through ideas about forgiveness, through ideas about writing as a particular process and uh, the, the types of expressions that we hear today. So it's my great pleasure to be, be, to be able to introduce Dr. Marth Ida, um, who is going to present today and her accolades are numerous, too much for me to um, talk about in this uh, space of time. But just to kind of pull out a few of the highlights uh, about our guest is that she's a renowned, renowned um, activist, a writer and a surgeon. She is a member of the board of Independent Journal of Burma Studies. She's elected to the board of Penn International in 2016. And she is currently the chair of Penn International's Writers in Prison Committee. And she is also the recipient of the Penn Barbara Goldsmith's Freedom to Write Award. And she's published numerous books, both in Burma, um, Burmese and uh, in English. And she's um, also held fellowships at Brown, Brown University in the US and the Radcliffe Institute of Advanced Studies at Harvard. So the list kind of goes on. But in particular, I think what's very inspiring and very interesting uh, is the kind of basis and the subject matter about uh, Marthida's um, uh, works. She spent time in the notorious insane prison uh, from uh, 1994 for endangering um, public peace uh, at a time when she was suffering from tuberculosis. tuberculosis. And she's also written about this um, in her kind of memoirs uh, written in, translated in English in 2017 as Prisoner of Conscious, uh, My Step Through Insane. So this is a kind of opportunity to really kind of pin down and understand um, the work of Marth Eder. And it's my great pleasure to welcome her here today. Thank you. Just to say that the format today as well is that there are also um, two of my colleagues, Professor Michael um, Charney, who's the chair of the Centre for um, South Asia, Southeast Asian Studies, and he will share his comments uh, and expertise on Myanmar. And the session as well is going to be um, moderated by the Professor of Practice in the Centre for International Studies and Diplomacy, Aiko Doden, uh, who is a journalist and works for Japan's um, public broadcaster, NHK. And this is a kind of co-hosted event, both by the uh, Department of Politics and International Studies and the Center for um, uh, Southeast Asian Studies. So a very warm welcome, and uh, I'm very much looking forward to this um, event. So thank you. Thank you, Graham, for the kind introduction. Uh, and thank you, Professor Charney, uh, Politics Department, and the Center on, uh, for South, Southeast A Asian Studies for um, hosting um, this event and making this possible. And um, I thank the audience for coming. Um, it's such a show of enthusiasm and interest to this very important topic. And I'm a journalist myself, also a professor of practice at uh, SOAS, um, and a friend of Matida. 
and I'm very happy to, to be able to be on the same panel uh, with Matida. Um, as uh, Professor Chani might also know, Matida is a known figure in Myanmar. So whenever I tell my friends in Yangon that I was going to see Matida, uh, someone, my colleagues would say, so may I come with you? I will carry your tripod. <laughs> and so I, I have to tell the person that I'm not going to film Matida, I'm not going to have lunch with her. But that's the amount of, uh, you know, the popularity that the Matida has and the respect she's garnered um, among the people of uh, Myanmar. Because of her um, courage and commitment to bring about democracy to the country. And so we are very happy to have her here. And I think this is such an apt occasion to welcome Matida, uh, just two days away from the three years um, anniversary uh, from the, the coup um, in 2021, um, when where the military violent, violently took down the democratically elected uh, government under Aung San Suu Kyi. So this is such a valued opportunity to hear firsthand from uh, someone like Matida, who is actually and literally living Myanmar's struggle for democracy. And let me just briefly explain how we plan this event. Uh, this evening, um, it, this will begin by Matida um, giving us a lecture for about 30 minutes. And then uh, Mike uh, will comment and share his comment, uh, expert views regarding uh, Matida's talk. This will be followed by 30 minutes conversation with Matida with Mike as discussant, followed by questions and answers from the floor for the next 30 minutes. And so, uh, Marty, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, all of my uh, friends and the colleagues. I really appreciate to be here at the time of the difficult and pretty much like uh, critical also. This is the very hard time for all the Burmese and all the friends of Burmese, but Burma. So it's a very uh, hard walk for me to finish the book. And it, it took me almost one and a half years to find the design and the writing, uh, the, 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 the flow of the book, but it took me less than three months to finish the whole book. This book is going to be published very soon, and uh, the it's might be 500 pages long. So I try my best to, uh, with the help of the PowerPoint, I try my best to talk about the issue, not about the book, indeed, because the book, the, the design of the book is pretty much like not pure nonfiction, but I, I, I love storytelling. So it's mixed and very different form of the, the design. So, but today I just want to focus on the, issues and the facts. <laughs> so the I, I make the book title is just simple amazed. I use a dash maze. We were amazed to see what's going on in our own beloved lands because it's turned out to be a maze. So um, it's it's a question mark for us. You know, as soon as the coup happened in 2021, a lot of people ask me because I wrote the book, The Roadmap, in 2010, before 2010. It's published in 2012 and the, uh, 11. And then the final uh, chapter of the book is called Fork in the Road. Since 2011, all the journalists keep asking me, where are you right now? After this, the quasi-civilian, quasi-military governments. And I keep saying, we are still at the fork in the road. And after the coup, people started raising the questions whether we are making a U-turn. And I said, no, because we were never been to the point B from point A where we were. That's why there was no U-turn. We were still at the point A in a maze. So this is the, the 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 key argument of this book is you know how comes we were in a maze why we were in a maze and what 
this current spring revolution beyond 2021 is doing, either getting out of a mess or getting rid of its walls. This is the, all about my understanding the issue, and it is all about my uh, attempt to understand the issues. It's all about my book, <laughs> indeed. Uh, to make a very short history, you know, since 1962, there was a group and Burmese uh, Socialist Program Party took the power. And since 1971, it's changed into the one political party system constitution. And I wrote that roadmap and I made the starting point was in 1988. It was the, the whole country protest looking for democracy at that time, you know? We we were uh, in the middle of the uh, road in 1990 election. The main opposition party won the election, but there was no power of uh, transfer of the power or nothing happened. Instead, we were detoured to the path of the, <laughs> the uh, somewhere from 1993 because of the uh, constitu uh, the, the national convention to draw the draft of the constitution. And then we were in the road bro from since 93 to 2005. Only in 2005, a lot of the political prisoners were released and the, the movement of the civil society came pretty much alive. And in 2005, it's another kind of the opening. It's not the starting point. It's kind of the hint for the way out because of the release Polka prisoners started convincing the, the community to stand out again, something like that. But of course, we were in the junction in 2007, the Saffron Revolution, and afterwards in 2008, the Nargis, Cyclone Nargis, something like that. But beyond 2008, 2010, it was like the fork in the road. We can make either U-turn or we can choose any different paths. But I think uh, from 2010, the NLD and Aung San Suu Kyi, she was released pretty late, but they decided not to join for the general election in 2010. And since there was no uh, confident, effective uh, rivalry, the military political party, USDP, won the majority, and then saying the generals become the leader of the, the country, the, the uh, president of the country, and Myanmar Peace Centers. So from 2010 to 2012, they were pretty making sure they enjoy doing all uh, three pillars walks, you know, executive, legislative, and the judiciary walk. But what happened from 1946 to the to, to right now? You know, you can see the escalation of the conflict. Even though the the politically we having moving this along, there are so many new ethnic armed forces has been came up. So even in 2000, beyond 2010, there are a couple of new uh, armed forces based on the identity, the, the, the ethnic identities is, is coming up. So there was no time for peace throughout this history. And beyond 2012, it's very uh, interesting be, uh, on 20th April 2012, there was by election and ended, NLD won, the Aung San Suu Kyi party won 43 out of 40, uh, 44. Indeed, one is disqualified. <laughs> so they won 100, but the one is disqualified for quite a silly uh, statement. Then what happened in 2012, May 6, there was incidents, the rape incidents in Rakhai. So less than a month. It's pretty like within two weeks time. And it was thought to be no coincidence, you know, because it's uh, since then, you know, since 2012, the state of emergency has been applied to Rakhine states until 2016. So that's mean, according to the 2008 constitution, if there is a state of emergency, the 
decisions making for all operations, all three pillars is in the hands of commander in chief, no more in the hands of the other. So in July, 2012, censorship relaxation and the whole war in July and including us, of course, it was very good, but I have a big doubt to be frank because the hate speech campaign and the hate threats among the society based on religion and race has been pretty much higher in since July, since just before July, you know? So to be frank, I, I couldn't show any evidence, but it's thought to be the relaxation of censorship is needed to distribute the hate speech. And the military always tries to prove they are the saviors of the country and they need instability inside the country to prove that the presence of them is much more important than the others. You know, so it's a very big doubt for me. And there are some other in, uh, the, the small little uh, facts and information and in, I, I explain in my book, but I couldn't explain here. It's too much already. So the... The good thing is freedom of association law in 2013, and the since they declare the military ever declare the multi-party uh, political systems, and they also uh, try to convince the world we are on the right track to democracy. But I, I'm not sure. That's why I said since 2010 we were in a maze, indeed not on the track to democracy, even with the freedom of association law, even with the having the more than uh, 90 political parties. Since the military started saying we are going on the multi-party uh, system, they need more parties rather than well-established military-run USTP. So some of the ethnic political parties is funded and organized by them, by the military. It's It's been pretty well known. So it's that's why for the civil society also, according to the freedom of association law, I think we should uh, appreciate because Pan Myanmar can be a running is 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 established since two thousand thirteen as soon as the freedom of association law has been established. But at the same time, there are a lot more other civil society organizations, more or less either funded, supported, or behind the scenes. Uh, approved by military can also enjoy the law. So in 2015, it's also very important, just before the Tainsaying government and the USTP run the parliaments has st uh, stopped, they established the protection of race and religion bill. It has been known as the four bills, and it's very much to undermine the freedom of religion and freedom of the uh, uh, the, the, the uh, gender issue, marriage issue, so many. So that's why I want to say we were already in a mess, but we thought we were on a passage because we were in a, in a corner. It's a bigger space like the freedom because in, after 2015, the opposition could enjoy the the leadership in the country. After 2015, they won the election and they can have the 75% the in the, not all 75%, the, the most of the 75% of the civilian share because the 25% is reserved for the military presence. Every single, not just as national assembly, but also the regional assemblies. At the same time for the executive, Ministry of Defense, Ministry of uh, home Affairs, under Ministry of Home Affairs, there is police forces. So it means all the legal armed forces is directly under the control of Commander-in-Chief. And the Ministry of Border Affairs, all three ministries is directly under the control of Commander-in-Chief. Even for appointing the Commander-in-Chief, there is no one can do, no, no the, nor the President, nor the other people. It's itself. That's why unilaterally, May Online declare himself as the ongoing commander in chief, even though he reached his pension year, 
60 years old. But he said, I couldn't find any suitable persons to succeed me. That's why I will be <laughs> as the commander in chief for another five years, something like that. So the, the whole, and even for the Supreme uh, judiciary system, the Supreme Court, uh, according to the 2008 constitution, the appointed, the current Supreme uh, Jewish uh, uh, judges, he, uh, ju uh, jury in chief, he can serve the positions until 70 years of age. So by the time when he was appointed to that uh, position in 2010, he was only 55 years. So he's still surviving as the, <laughs> so he's the ex-military general and he keeps serving as the head of the judiciary, the whole judiciary system until today. Then we can see 2008 constitution itself is a very big maze for us. We, we have no way to get out of this because the article 436 of 2008 constitution, it's bar to change anything, even for the vocabulary. It's very hard, you know, so that's that's why the constitution itself is a big miss. And very, uh, I might say the military itself is a very patriarchal and corrupted institution. And what the military right now, the Myanmar Lai military, uh, the, I, I, would, I am going to say the commander in chief, uh, CIC military, I don't want to pronounce his name. So this CIC military, it's doing the self-sabotage, you know, by corruption. That's why they are not doing the governance. They are just destroying the country and destroying themselves until now. So it's uh, very hard for us to get out of the maze because some of the religious figures also intervened the societal issues. And these religious figures are being well supported by the military too. And they always looking for supports from the military. That's, that's how the relationship between the religious figures and the uh, military leaders. It's has been throughout the history. And, and another thing I have been saying this for so long is the intellectual blindness. How did they do? Since 1962, we have censorship until 2012, five decades of censorship. At the same time, propaganda machine is still working until now. So very heavy censorship and the ineffective education system. These three things making us, our society intellectually blind. And I normally say, most of our people don't know what they don't know. This is the most serious problem when we do serious educational uh, things on the human rights and democracy. But after the, the freedom of the association law, we can do something. So we keep working on the training and education about the human rights and democracy. That's why I think this is the very first time after the 2021, the biggest achievement ever is people show how much they do know their role in making the change. That's why their motto is without our consent, nobody can govern us. This is the spring revolution motto. And this is the biggest achievement ever in our history, I think. In the past, the people, they, they really can't understand their role, but they now comes to the sense their role and they show how much they know it and they practice it. So yeah, the then yeah, social media platform with the height of the technology change and social media, it's very enjoyable for the military to distribute misinformation and disinformation. And it's very effective and it's going on still. And it's that's another kind of the maze we were in and we still are in. And the I, I would like to say in the international media's oversimplifications, narratives, you know, our issues is so much complicated because of that. And the, another thing is there is still no right to information as a law in my country. Because of that, even for us, 
access to information is very questionable. And then that's why the international community cannot understand much about what's going on, really, reality on the ground. For that reason, I think they try to oversimplify to understand. And that's why the narratives of having the new election will be helpful for us. But according to our experience, having election means not much political change. Having elections in 1990, nobody recognized the, the results. And it's always being uh, used by military to manipulate us. Again, in 2020, the election results was overwhelmingly uh, the opposition's won, but they don't want this uh, uh, the result, so that's why they try to do this attempt. So, and then uh, another big issue is the peace business. I might say the either the Myanmar Peace Band Center or the National Reconciliation uh, and Peace Center, uh, run under the Insane and the the uh, Aung San Suu Kyi government, is a. Uh, pretty much like not actual ground to find the mediation. It's more like direct negotiation between the state's military and the ethnic armed forces. So there, there is no mediation and that's why it's based on the their own interests. It's based on some of the political or the economic interests of these armed forces. That's why its peace is not as the pure, uh, the, the, the peace process is not the pure platform for looking for peace. So it's it's another maze we are in, we were in. Yeah? And then related to that, the identity politics has been pretty much uh, overwhelming. You know, the federalism, under the title of the federalism, the, uh, the ethnicity issue has been pretty much like very important. That's why if you want to be recognized as someone on the stage to talk legitimately to the power, uh, people with power, you either have a uh, kind of the ethnicity identity or the armed. That's why all the armed forces make their organization, their groups under the title of the ethnicity. So there is not based on the political ambition most of the new armed forces are based on the ethnicity. That's identity politics is still going on. It's a maze, another maze. And in 2016, of course, the state's consular law, as soon as the NRD won the election and when it get the to the parliaments, it established a state consular law because Aung San Suu Kyi was barred not to become the president according to the 2008 constitution. So the lawyer, they invented the, the state consular law according to the uh, 2008 constitution. One of the article in the 2008 constitution is giving this law have a chance, the state consular aiming at one point Tan Shui the ex-general, the ex-dictator can be part of the leading scheme. That's why they put this article, but the lawyer of NLD very subtly crafted this law in order to give the post of the state councillor to Aung San Suu Kyi. So that was very, very effectively making such a uh, tension between the military and the uh, NLD and Aung San Suu Kyi. So that's why that lawyer, Ukoni, exactly yesterday, uh, six years ago, he was assassinated at the airport. So that's all the maze we have <laughs> get lost in that. And another very first tensions about the uh, announcing the general amnesty of the political prisoners. So as soon as the NLD took the power, everybody was waiting for a chance to make the general amnesty, but NLD couldn't have it. Because according to the constitution, we do need a census from the, the uh, Defense and Security Council. Six out of 11 members of this Defense and Security Councils are all generous military personnel. Even though the civilians part of the, this council try to introduce anything, they will try to 
undermine or reject. Because of this potential, NLD government never ever called the meeting of the Defense and Security Council. That was the biggest tension for between the NLD and the military again, because military thought as soon as NLD got the power, it's trying to undermine the rule of military in every single aspect and in every single way. You know, the way they look at these things is very different from the way the international community look at that. So it's another maze, uh, it's a double maze, I, I might say. So 2017 incidents also is very interesting. Uh, Commander in chief is, it, he was in Tokyo at the time, uh, but as soon as he got back on August 9, he was meeting with the ANP, the American National Party leaders, but they announced it's the meeting is for the peace and development in Rakhine. But AMB leader said CIC made detailed explanation about the operation, but never disclosed what operation it was, what kind of operations we could emerge in, something like that. It happened, but because of the these facts, uh, uh, we cannot uh, easily uh, looking back right now because all posted uh, under the. Uh, military Facebook page. It has been sacked in 2018 by Facebook, you know. So, but we, we luckily got the information and the IJBS, one of the, the writers of the IJBS has been, uh, wrote this article very detailed. So uh, in that case, uh, it was, uh, it happens in, on August 9, about the Rakhine State incidents. Indeed, uh, their aim is, and next day, the vice commander in chief and the minister of the defense, they went to see a state councilor to declare the state of emergency in Rakhine State because it's lifted in 2016. So they want to reintroduce in 2017, but she declined because if there is an announcement of the state of emergency in Rakhine State, it should be in the hands of commander in chief to operate every single things, every single aspect. So she denied, she just issued the, the order, curfew order sections uh, 144. But interestingly, Ministry of Defense Facebook has shown photo news two regiments, regiments 33 and 99, including 70 battalions has been deployed already, either by road or either by air. Deploying troops by air was very, very rare, but it was done on August 10. At the same time, they, they asked about to issue the state of emergency. Indeed, they already decided to run the operation. They just want to inform having this. But yes, everyone expected. She just talked about this issue only on the 19th September. So this is what happened in the past, it's it's like a very, uh... so in 2018, the NRE having the tension with the Karani or Kaya for the Bojo statue, the his, uh, her father's statues. Indeed, here I just used the Bojo statue. For me, this term is also very uh, allergic to me because he, her father, Aung San, was assassinated not as a general, but as a members of parliament at, at the time of the assassination in 1947. But after 1962, the very first dictator Ne Win, military dictator Ne Win, throughout these days, through the propaganda machine, through the textbooks in the education, they refer him to as Bocho, generals. That's giving the whole society the impression of the only one and respectable leader should be the military officer, the general. So that's, it's the 
not not just through the, the the censorship, not just through the subtle propaganda. It's also through the education process. It's very well designed the whole society to believe in militarizations. So, and in 2019, I don't want to uh, discuss small minor things. In 2020, there was the COVID and some other issues has been doing, and since then. As soon as the results has been uh, established, even though the USTB and the military supporters started uh, protesting, indeed, it's very ridiculous, you know, the results, election results is NRE won the majority. But in small little towns, the NRE supporters and USTB celebrating their victory. Out of blue, people don't know what's going on. But because they already know that's going to be the coup. That's why they enjoy it and they say, okay. So that's uh, also, but since then, NLE has been using the term national unity government. They aim for having the national unity government, even though they won the majority of the, the seats, but it's also another very, uh, Big issues to discuss. I, I don't want to disclose very detail. It's also so just before uh, the on the first February, the states of emergencies uh, declared by SAC unilaterally. It's didn't according to the 2008 constitution, current constitution, they cannot do that. So it's the the attempt of the coup in, on the first February is. According to 2008 constitution, it's the high treason itself. But they just say, we still keep the 2008 constitution, they make some excuse and they just did it. So the, uh, beyond that, the, the, the committee representing the parliament, Pidang uh, Zulutto, set up by the elected members of parliaments in 2020 election in, on the 5th February, and the National Unity Government in April, and the People's Defense Forces started in May. After a couple of weeks with the peaceful protests, a lot of people were shot down and arrested. So people decided to take arms. But it's a, a hybrid revolution, I might say. The peaceful protest is still going on, even though the armed revolution is being added to the resistance. So the, and this is the graph. You can see the armed, uh, the, the peaceful demonstrations, it's in blue and the uh, civilians, uh, the, the SACs, the violence against civilians is in green and the civilians fatality. So it's pretty much very obvious that's how they handle with the protests, peaceful protests. And this is the 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 SAC uh, setting fire to the civilians' houses and airstrikes to the civilian targets and the military targets. It's also very obvious how they do their targets is becoming for the civilians. And it keeps extending their term according to the current constitution. They they going to declare what we'll be doing tomorrow or the day after tomorrow on first uh, February because they do the term already every six months. They they do need some things to uh, keep up. So uh, there are some issues since twenty uh, second June. The Aung San Suu Kyi was uh, moved from the court rooms to the prisons venue, and in July 2022, they executed the activists Jimmy and Pio Ziyato. Pio Ziyato was also a member of parliament, and the since then, yeah, the, the some of the release of the political prisoner is still going on. And in December, she was sentenced to 33 years. And this is the pretty much outdated. <laughs> the, uh, since the 27th October last year, so many uh, kind of the battles going on in so many places. And so far, 
almost 40 cities on the ground has been conquered by the resistance forces, resistance armed forces. And it's more than, it's thought to be, I think the around 20, thousands soldiers has been surrendered and the defected and almost 20,000 soldiers has been killed and a lot more has been injured already. I mean the military, that the SAC soldiers. So it's pretty bloody on the ground. Uh, and last uh, 2023 March, NAD was dissolved as a political party because the new electoral law is pretty much ridiculous. It's it's uh, in terms of the the demands for the deposit money and demands for the the amount of the population of the membership is pretty much ridiculous. And the it's aims for the next elections going to nowhere. That's why uh, Xi'an National Leagues for Democracy and NLD decided not to register again. So they were pretty much dissolved as a political party. But the keep going atrocities is the airstrikes in the kind uh, division so going on, you know. So uh, it's a yeah. This is some of the facts. I I don't want to say details. And after the coup, also yeah, two point five million is displaced. By the time now, I think it's it's almost three millions already because every single day people need to leave their places because of the battles and the atrocity and the fire or the area bombardment, something like that. So, so many uh, humanitarian assistance has been needed and it's, it's still not yet met. And this is some of the... On the ground, the currently the national unity government is doing something for the humanitarian assistance, but compared to the needs, it's it's just not big uh, problem, uh, not not big uh, supporting on the ground. It's pretty much struggling, and I feel you know because of so many reasons, the global trend of the shrinking of the civil space. And the 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 post pandemic uh, economic problems, and the global trend of the authoritarian rules, and so many new war on earth, making us pretty much in another mess. I say, I I, I pretty feel we are uh, only the diaspora. Burmese all over the world are the key funders for the resistance movement, not official uh, assistance from any other uh, government yet. So we still fighting. Most of the uh, attempt and most of the movement and activities with the resistance right now is trying to getting rid of the walls of the maze, but still not yet successful that much. But we already on the path to tearing down the walls of the maze because we cannot be living inside the maze. What has been very black magically <laughs> crafted by the military. So it's, uh, I think it's all, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Matida. I think uh, you have to write another book um, on the modern history seen through your eyes or do a like a series of webinar um, and, and I hope you won't test us on the how much we've learned from you but uh, that would be lovely and um, I would like to um, ask Mike to comment on uh, what Matida has to say. Yeah, well um, as Matida's talk shows um, Burma is one of the most complicated countries in Southeast Asia and and what we've seen over the past, um, oh, how many years since independence, since 1948, is that a lot of problems don't get resolved. They just get layered. You just had one problem after another, and they don't get resolved. And we can understand a lot of what's happened right now. Part of it you can't even cover because you would just have to deal with so much of the history to deal even with why Arakan, the Arakan army is doing, you know, fighting for autonomy and that kind of thing. But in terms of my comments on, on what you talk about here, and I'm going to have to 
come up with a simplified narrative because again, it's so complicated. You can't possibly deal with all the uh, the factors. Um, it's not deniable that Burma lost democracy in 1962, uh, but we have to question just how much Burma has ever really enjoyed full civil liberties. Um, be, not certainly not before the colonial period, not during the colonial period, not under UNU. And one thing we don't talk about with UNU is that so many journalists and others were in prison even in his time. Um, not after UNU, not since 1962, not since 2011 or even 2017. And it's clear though that um, that the response of people to the 2021 coup was not just about democracy. It wasn't an issue about having democracy anymore. It was about they want democracy plus. They want civil liberties as well. That's one of the things that came out really clearly from looking at the crowds. And it was not about, um, they just didn't want uh, majoritarian rule anymore. And it was much more than we saw in 1988 or 2007, which could be depicted in that way. Um, the Spring Revolution has been successful in part because regardless of the limits to democracy, growing up in Burma or experience in the Burma from 2011 did see a lot more exposure and a lot more maneuver room, um, a greater commitment to, uh, um, uh, uh, by people to, uh, um, uh, to, uh, to make clear a greater uh, desire for civil liberties. And it wasn't just, you know, ethnic tolerance and the Rohingya and LGBT and and the commitment to inclusion and everything else. It was uh, it was just like a real desire to to bring Burma um, up to date with all these liberties that people enjoy in uh, democratic countries. But this is also why the Spring Revolution has not been not yet succeeded. Even um, obviously, if we were talking a year ago, you might not be quite as positive as you are right now because a lot of the gains have really accelerated in the last year. Um, because it's not just about because it's not just about democracy anymore, we've seen other groups that have emerged that are just as much against an inclusive Burma, um, and that's why I I I don't think this is as much. We sometimes pick this depict this as military coup. People oppose the military, but it, one of the reasons the military has kept going despite many times it should have collapsed already is it's more of a civil war, because you do have elements in Burmese society who. Um, they don't. They 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 may not have been on board for military rule versus democracy per se, but they are on board for things like keeping Muslims out and uh, holding on to uh, uh, ethnic Burmese strict Burmese ethno uh, uh, ethno nationalism, and really pitching that kind of vision of the country. Um, there's that that kind of commitment to uh, to Burman ethno nationalist hegemony. So um, this was something that was also built up, ironically, during the very same period since 2011. This 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 kind of um, uh, popular feeling. So the problem before uh, before us is that um, no one was really committed to military rule, but except for the military. But um, but what you have now is the major. Uh, you have people who are who are opposed to. Um, the old style or the um, the vision of Burma as a as a Burman entity and those who see it as much more broad inclusive of federal Burma. So the the legacy of the transition, um, uh, uh, in a way, um, as Mathi Da has pointed out, um, but one in which uh, 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 one in which the uh, the is is that it is a maze, as Mathi Da says. But now since two thousand eleven, the hedges have become a lot higher. And they're trickier, and it's much more difficult to find a way out. Now, um, some of the things you didn't mention are one of the things you didn't mention. I noticed that you you didn't say a whole lot about how you feel about Aung San Suu Kyi now, and I'm guessing probably you haven't changed your opinion too much. But but the, it must have raised some concern that over the period we're talking about, she had started to move away from the herself, started to try to whether it was strategy or something else. But she started to depict herself as a friend of the military, as being a general's daughter. And I know that some civil rights groups have mentioned, people have mentioned me who knew her at the time, was that they noticed that the change had taken place because she started to emphasize that she wasn't an activist. Uh, she was a general's daughter. And, you know, there were all those photo ops and everything else. For all people who had spent the 1990s in prison, what did that do to their feelings of her commitment to, you know, to, to be budding up to the military like that? Um, and so, anyway, this is an important all. Uh, and the other thing, uh, uh, you didn't mention, you mentioned the August 2017 incident, but you didn't mention the Ringa uh, by name. And I, and I'm not raising this point to be belligerent or to, um, you know, uh, uh, to because, but I am trying to raise it to, to emphasize that 
that actually we can't just draw clear lines on everything about people being on one side and the other. It's hugely complicated, right? Um, so this is an important con this has important consequences for Burma's future, but it's also important for us to remember the 2011 to 21 period. Uh, uh, who we see as the good guys and the bad guys, according to these simplified narratives we come up, up with, how we see the tax in Rohingya, and how we understand Aung San Suu Kyi is really unclear what we'll be talking about in the next 10 years, depending on who wins, right, and and how they win. So the last will probably be a, a, um, the last will probably be a question uh, that fades out over time, but for right now, I wonder whether we should see to, since up until relatively recently, all we did when we talked about Burma was talk about Aung San Suu Kyi. Should we see Aung San Suu Kyi as a hero, as a villain, or someone who, since 2011, got lost in the maze? Well, I think the from the very beginning, it's a very not very right way to focus just one person to represent my country. You know, that's that's the pretty much like the. Uh, chicken and egg story, you know, as long as the international community focus mainly on her and looking her as the one and only person to solve all the solutions for our country and you undermine the role of the others, the citizens, the other citizens. And because of that, you know, giving her a enormous title, giving her the, 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 the enormous uh, privilege and that's making the, uh, one positive counter effect is the some people who not that much believe in her started thinking, oh, even these big guys from the West and the international community recognize her. Let's recognize her, something like that, you know, yeah. but, but, but she, the, the society just believe in her. And then we were never, uh, to be frank, you know, if we look through the, the the history, we were not like the French Revolution, you know. We were never against the imperialism. We were automatically destroy the imperialisms because of the colonization. So that's why the country itself is never been uh, setting as a nation <laughs> or the country. It's it's like the because of the colonization, you know. It's it's the, after the after that, it's automatically moved to the modern uh, country uh, after the independence, something like that. And then we were in the two extreme uh, kind of the feeling, you know, at one point, uh, we believe in one and only leader. Like the imperialist, the king or queen can solve everything for us. That the, the persons, if the leader will be good, the country will be good, something like that. So it's one extreme. At the other extremes is we normally say we have altogether five enemies, you know, five enemies is fire, water, and including the government. So the perspectives of the Burmese society to the rulers is not very positive. So whatever you did in the past, it's good or bad. If you gain the power, people will look at the power having people pretty much negative as enemy, something like that. So we are swinging this, the sensation in between this relying on the one and only leader and uh, uh, refusing the, the, the ruler, something like that. So in, in this situation, I think the effect of the international community keep finding her, Aung San Suu Kyi, as the one and only leader making us more uh, difficult situation, how to accept her, how to uh, contribute. That's why I say that after the 2021, nobody's that much talk about Aung San Suu Kyi inside the country because they know their role and they know that they, they, they need to go by themselves. So it's a very clear signal inside the country. But the irony is, you know, in the past, everybody just, uh, criticize, okay, one lady shows is not good. Now the the resistance group, uh, resistance movement has been led by the collective leadership. Mm -hmm. Then everybody asks, who shall we look at as the leader of your resistance? 
outcomes. So that's another kind of the maze, I might say, you know, the concept of the, the, the concept from the ground and concept imposed from the outside is not very much in that way. So it's another layer of the maze we are now facing. But hopefully, I what I understand is, for example, like Rohingya issue, we were, you know, I, I was I was pretty much very badly criticized by the ultra nationalist monks because my stance with the I, I work for Muslim Free Hospital and I, I pretty much empathy to these people. But for me, humanity is the base. And I I I don't like the identity politics and I, I don't believe in blood, to be frank. I'm also not Bama, but I'm happy to be recognized as Bama. It's okay for me. It's it's not worthy for me to be identified under this title. I just want to be recognized as human being, something like that. So for but for the majority of people, they are in between this kind of the identity crisis for themselves. They really cannot accommodate themselves in so many labels imposed inside the country or up from outside. So I think the for the Rohingya issue, it was very hard. But after the coup, it's more uh, positive responses and attempt from the collective leadership, one of the Rohingya becoming the deputy minister or ministry of the human rights and yeah of the national unity government something like that you know so it's a not very uh, very promising as we wish but it's still moving to more uh, inclusive way you know mm -hmm. not just inclusive way i mean uh, justice and inclusive I, I don't believe in the pure inclusiveness because the sac the very first uh, member of the cabinet of the state administrative council for the Kamena chief is very inclusive, <laughs> very inclusive in terms of the <laughs> ethnicity. Right. And in terms of uh, Aung San Suu Kyi's role, that was precisely one of the topics that uh, I was intending to ask both of you. But uh, when uh, Aung San Suu Kyi was released from house arrest in 2002, um, in May, um, I was at the NLD headquarters and I had a chance to speak with her. And I asked her a question regarding what the, how she thinks uh, democracy can be brought about to Myanmar. And uh, she responded that um, the people should not think that democracy is something that someone else uh, can bring to them. No, you have to work towards um, bringing about democracy to your country. And I'm thinking, of course, we don't have access to Aung San Suu Kyi now. But, but something in me tells me that, that she might be um, partially happy that uh, the day has, the time has come for people to try and uh, define what democracy is all about and mm -hmm. how they might collectively work uh, towards um, you know, achieving it. I mean, we can't be too you know, optimistic and have a rosy picture about everything, but it's a very interesting sign that we are seeing today. And I also want to ask Mike, because um, in Myanmar, um, the relationship between people used to be defined by you know, Sayada pay relation, you know, a patron client relationship with a, a very imposing figure like Aung San Suu Kyi or the military and the followers. But do you think that we are seeing a change in that today? Well, I, I, th I think we saw a big change in that from, uh, from the CDM. Um, and one of the big things that stuck out from that was all these people who had shifted, again, not to be too critical of her, I don't want to make it, you know, so she do asking, but a lot of people didn't like the way that she was running the NLD in a very hierarchical and a patriot client uh, way. And so they'd started shifted, shift to other parties. And it's a lot of these people who we saw on top of the buses and cars and that thing, meeting the people in the CDM. And of course, the one of the problems was, is that I think some of the NLD leadership at the time tried to pitch everything as being about her particularly, but the protests were actually about the full range of things that they wanted back from the military. Um, so yeah, I, I think I think that that's one of the big problems. Actually, I think it's been it's become partly a problem because it's a good thing when you have all these disparate groups uh, opposing the military. It shows it's very broad based, but it's very hard to coordinate a. Uh, and it, usually in civil wars, what we've seen historically is that the winner is usually one that's the most centrally organized and can. Uh, um, now, I think the military is weak, and so this this is allowed to uh, this is not allowed it to achieve full victory, mm -hmm. but it has prolonged the conflict that mm -hmm. the opposition is so hydra headed. 
Mm -hmm. And I'm sure during the questions and answers um, period that there might be questions about the role of Aung San Suu Kyi as well as the, the current situation we are seeing with regards to the opposition uh, offensive towards the military, which you have yes. referred to. And um, I would also like to uh, dive into that. Um, uh, I, I'm sure the audience here are very much familiar with the situation, but the, the current situation is that the um, you know, the, event, the events of the last three months um, since the the three uh, Brotherhood Alliance, that's the coalition of the ethnic armies, um, have uh, initiated Operation 1027, which was October 27th this year, which is a major offensive that, that took over several uh, towns, bases in the north, uh, close to China, which was originally occupied by the military. Um, how has that shifted the the powers in Myanmar, and what does it say about the dynamics in Myanmar? Do you think, Matida? What does it say about the military today? Well, I think the military is doing the suicide attempt by itself, you know, with the corruption and self sabotage. Uh, I think we believe we were told its population is five hundred thousand, but it sounded like they have the maximum is 200,000. With the defection and everything, the real combatants is the total population of the combatants because some are the, just the work, the, the staff, the, the, the clerical staff and the, some other who don't want to fight. <laughs> so the total number will be uh, 70,000, something like that. So and, and that's the morale is also low. Morale is pretty low because of the social punishment. In the past, you know, people uh, try to cooperate with them, some people. But right now, every single person's trying to uh, trying to get the information from them leaked to the resistance group. So that's why they they are uh, failing, and the the way they recruit is two level, the low level soldiers, the real fighters and the high ranking officer. Mm -hmm. For the high ranking officers, the incentives to do the bribery at the civilian's post. This was the, 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 the way they recruit. And for the low level soldiers, the real fighters, it's more like the human trafficking. You know, it's by force and the, all the unemployed, uneducated thugs were recruited. That's why right now, even though they are well equipped, you know, in terms of the military weapons and the artilleries, the, the, the Myanmar military is on the war's rank 38. But they are failing almost 99% of the battles against three years old, the Peter's Defense Forces, because they couldn't use. And the Peter's Defense Forces is now running mainly on the technology, the drone bombardment is very effective. And the recently what we found it out at the, the one battalion space very near to the Defense Service Academy, it was captured by the, the resistance forces and found it out that the, the, they arrested the top of the leaders of this the, the battalion. And he was, the, the, in the picture, he was smiling. And when the interview, it's like he, he was much relieved, you know, oh, now I, I can be alive, something like that. But when the the defense, uh, the, the resistance forces interview him and he confessed that most of his soldiers, it's a kind of the uh, trainers at the technical institution. He's also the prof professor, the, the lecturer or professor at the Defense Technical Institute. He was not the combatant. He was never, he has no experience at all in the fighting, he confessed. And then the these the, the soldiers for his battalion is three persons from the medics, three persons from the <laughs> firefighters, something like that. So he said during this fight, after the surrender, during this fight, the the key message to these fighters from him is try to shoot, try to shoot because they really don't know how to shoot, nor dare not to shoot. They are not yet ready, but since they have not enough population, they, they have so many uh, fronts on the ground, so they cannot deploy properly 
that's why I think this is also another problem for them. Yeah. yeah. But uh, in Myanmar, military was um was about infallibility. Um, never makes mistakes. Always right. Father of the nation. Um, holding institution that holds the country together. So, do you think that narrative is no longer valid? It's from the very beginning. It was not valid, mm -hmm. but yeah, it was true. It, it this is the narratives to be, uh, to be told by the others. Uh, that's that's the reasons. They they are propaganda machine is very well effective even to the the outside. For example, like the the CIC speech in last a couple of months, in Burmese version and the the English version is pretty different. Mm -hmm. So the 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 their propaganda machine is targeting not just us, but the international community to misunderstand things. Something like that. Yes, so that's that's was never been true. They are the key because, as I said, to prove they are the saviors of the country, they truly need disunity and distrust among each other mm -hmm. and instability. That's why, if there is no stab uh, if there is stability, they try to make <laughs> incidences mm -hmm. to destroy the stability. Okay, so now they're seeing the reality. Yeah, but but Mike, on the part of the ethnic armed organizations. Um, how well are they coordinated, do you think, Mike? Because uh, the impression among many was that, that they are awfully fragmented. They, and they, they are never, fragmented. Uh, and how, they, they have their own special concerns. Right, it's and very different particular. interests as well. Yeah. No? How, how coordinated are they, do you think? They're not very well coordinated. That's one of the big problems. We have so many un, uncoordinated groups right, all opposed right. to the military, which makes it difficult for the, for the military to, to take things back over, but it prevents mm -hmm. the opposition from unseating the military. And I just want to add a comment to one of the comments earlier is that one of the things that the military had done so, more, so much of was, was smoke and mirrors um, is that the Damodaw was was much larger on paper than it was in reality uh, because of the corruption involved. And that's why so often they had to rely on one one or two special regiments, 33 Light Infantry Regiment, for example, fly them in to do something. And so they were really caught off guard when you had this CDM explode like it did, and then the actual opposition. I thought for, for a little while that was the best time to unseat the military. Um, it didn't, it, you know, it takes a long time when a people has been suppressed like that to come around, and, and now we're getting back again. But I, I think that was a lost opportunity when because they couldn't cover much of the country at that particular time. Mm -hmm. They've been so reliant on a, f a few regiments and everything else was on paper. Martita, what, what about you? Um, how do you see the level of coordination among the EAOs? As well as uh, how much uh, initiative is there on the part of a national unity government, which is the civilian government in e exile? Um, made up of um, activists, politicians who oppose the the coup. Um, what what do you think? Uh, well, it's hard to see uh, NUG as a government in exile because some of the cabinet members are still inside mm -hmm. inside the country mm -hmm. on the ground. Well, it's a coordination among the ethnic armed forces and NUG is ongoing process. It's not yet uh, to the momentum yet, mm -hmm. but it's it's thought to be. Tomorrow, by tomorrow, we're going to read the new statements by them, more collaboration, cooperation. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, 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 it's a, of course, the, the civil war is more than 70 years. So, yeah, misunderstanding has been overwhelmed. So within these three years, they are trying to do not very effectively, but it's, it's on its ways, I mean, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, um People wonder, um, is the military down uh, and is it out? Is end feasible? What, what is your view? Well, with the military, the the situation right now is cannot be worse than ever, you know. So with without them, it can be worse, but it's better. Mm. I, I might see because the 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 example of the military is the as an institution pretty much corrupted and the the impunity is the the real big issue they are committing and then they don't care about you know so yeah when we talk about the civil liberties you know this is the institution never ever willing to grant the civil liberties something like that so with 
their presence. I mean, we, we don't want any military. We need to reestablish uh, a military. You know, not with these current top leaders or some already committed uh, soldiers, mm -hmm. something like that. And and we see uh, in the the news reporting um, that the the role of China in it, um, China is allowed to mediate, but it's also selling uh, weapons. H how do you see China's role in it, Matilda? Well, we cannot move our country away from China. So that's the biggest challenge. And China always on one hand is a torch, one hand is water. That's their policy. And yeah, it's a, it's, it's wants to be that China always wants to be behind every single stakeholders. Hmm. That's the conflict of interest by itself and among us. That's going on, but uh, I think for the longer run, of course, we need to be very careful looking at their play because it's also behind some of the armed forces, mm. and it's uh, the some ethnic armed forces thinking of having more than federalism, and you know it's it's pretty much dangerous, easily be conquered by China if not by India. Meaning uh, they can be drawn closer to China's orbit, as as the ethnic minority. But but ethnic minority being ethnic minority in Myanmar is one thing, but being an ethnic minority in China is another, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it is a pretty much like that. Yeah, that's why we we need to be very careful. Yeah, uh, making the decisions in terms of politics right. because it's right. pretty much yeah right. dangerous. Like you might have something to well, say about China that. won't absorb role. Burma because, for one thing, it doesn't want an intersection between Thai groups and the Shan groups and that kind of thing. But uh, but China is already on the path to mm -hmm. dominating mm -hmm. Burma permanently. And and one of the big problems with the with the civil war too is that uh, China arms both sides, the ethnic armies mm -hmm. and the military, just as, so that both sides make deals not to harm Chinese infrastructure passing through the country. And so that's part of the the situation here we're, we're not going it's not going to play a role in the resolution of this the big the big question for the future is does china think it's going to benefit from a divided burma or a unified burma and if it thinks that it's going to benefit from a divided burma you're going to have virtual civil war going on forever true 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 but um we you must remember i remember when um the foreign ministers and prime ministers and presidents um, all wanted to march into Myanmar and shake hands with Sans and Suu Kyi when the country started opening up. And Myanmar sits right in the intersection of Belt and Road Initiative and um, Indo-Pacific strategy put forward by the US and its allies. But uh, unfortunately, there seems to be a sort of a um, absence of their, the West's presence um, in the region. Is isn't that a problem here? The, the uh, absence of the of West the presence. West. I mean, yes. the, the, the one of the big problems the West always has is when it does try to get involved, it's new imperialism. Mm. So, um, even when there were uh, people hoped that they would get involved after Nargis, for example, the military wasn't helping people after the uh, tsunami. Uh, the U.S. had an aircraft; it wouldn't get involved because it didn't want to be, you know, have the have these charges put against us. The the big game we're talking about the West now relative to China, but the big game being fought in Myanmar is actually between Japan mm. and uh, China. And this has been one of the reasons that Japan didn't step in earlier mm -hmm. uh, to deal with some of the humanitarian crises in Burma and the activities of the military, because they're trying to bolster any country that, uh, or they're trying to win the the uh, the friendship of any country that seems on the verge of falling within the Chinese orbit. And so I would actually say that the China versus Japan game is a much bigger game being played in Burma than the West versus China. Mm -hmm. That that game is being played out in Sri Lanka and the Maldives and other yeah. places mm -hmm. now, Papua New Guinea. Mm -hmm. In terms of ODA and providing uh, assistance for uh, infrastructure as, as well as humanitarian assistance, that there is a, a, a it is a, a mm -hmm. intensely uh, debated issue in Japan. Uh, very challenging indeed. So um, something that we have to keep an eye on. And, and I would also say that what the West is interested in will take a backseat increasingly to what India wants. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, about um, the youth of, um, the, the role of youth um, at the, the spring um, revolution, um, you, you said that uh, you were at one point not 
uh, very confident whether they they would be able to to stand up uh, raise their voice um when i interviewed you um during the mm -hmm. the darker days uh, you spoke about um freedom of expression is not about freedom to speak up not just about freedom to speak up but also about the freedom to to think um and that can be eroded when there is a uh, suppression and oppression but the uh, the youth did speak up and stand up. Uh, why is that, do you think? Well, I think the the most effective part of the censorship and propaganda is freedom of opinion, not on the freedom of expression. So if we our opinion has been pretty much well controlled and shaped by mainly, I, I might say mainly by propaganda and ineffective education rather than the censorship. Because if we know there is censor, we, everybody try to overcome the censor. But if we doesn't know it is the propaganda and ineffective education, people have no weapon to combat it. So that's why I think for the uh, youths in the earlier days, we really don't know how they will respond, how much they well equip with the knowledge and the ideology and opinion. But thanks to the new technology, I think the internet and mm -hmm. the, the open access to the so much uh, information, making them strengthen. In 1988, we didn't have those tools. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. During your days. Yes. Yeah. yeah, now it's a very, yeah open sources, making them more equipped with the knowledge and the opinion. True, true, true. Um, you know, the, the Freedom House just uh, published a report on visible and invisible bars, meaning um, the cost of raising their voices um, in, in countries where um, oppression still persists, uh, meaning you know, activists can be silenced in prison but imprisonment can mean damaging impact on the prisoners and their families um, amounts to civil death. Um, you have been in it too. I mean, the harassment and repression can perpetuate the behind bars and uh, beyond bars. I uh, understand that applies to Myanmar too. Sure, definitely. Yeah, I think being a Bur Burmese or being a, a person either inside the country or outside the country, we were already barred for some sort of the liberty, you know, uh, especially after this last coup, you know, the, the, uh, they tried just not to arrest and kill people. They also tried to make so much harassments to the family members and the properties. So for example, like I, my, my passport was denied to be extended. Mm -hmm. So that's that's kind of uh, response. Even though I, I keep writing, I, I, I try to say so many things. They cannot arrest me because I'm already outside, but they try to limit my uh, movement. True. And Something once like you that. go abroad, you face the risk of being deported yeah. to Myanmar. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. Time is almost up. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay. Well. Um. Well. Thanks for uh, attending. We've had uh, been given a thank you for uh, Iko Dodan and Mathi Da for uh, a very inter interesting event. We've had a lot to think about and a lot of interesting topics brought up on current Myanmar. I think we're still very much in the maze, so I don't think that's been resolved. Uh, but maybe in the future. Um. So I will call this event to a close. And thanks to you for your questions and for attending. Thanks. <laughs>